In his years at the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, Jim Leach has been involved in several high-profile deals, such as the sale of Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, and managed Canada's largest single-profession pension plan through some of the most volatile market periods in our history. He's announced he's retiring at the end of this year, but before he leaves, he's getting the word out about how pension plans need to change to keep up with these volatile economic times. Here's Jim Leach, President and CEO of the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, at least until December 31st, 2013. <laughs> nice to have you here in the studio. Thank you, Steve. Let's just bring everybody up to scratch on what your 2012 looked like, because some of these numbers are really quite astonishing if you're not in the pension business. For example, control room, let's bring this up. The teacher's pension plan serves 179,000 elementary and secondary school teachers. They serve 124,000 pensioners. They serve 69,000 inactive members. Those are former teachers who kept their pensions. They've got more than 900 employees. They got a 13% rate of return on investments for 2012. That generated $14.7 billion in investment income. And their net assets, $129.5 billion. When you look at those kinds of staggering numbers, one hardly thinks of a of a public sector or organization. You guys are more like a multinational corporation, aren't you? Well, we're certainly run like a business, that's yeah. for sure. But, uh, you know, in terms of a nest egg, how, how big is this relative to comparable organizations in the world? Oh, we're the 19th largest pension plan slash sovereign wealth fund in the world. It, so that's not, that, that includes countries? Uh, sovereign wealth funds in countries such as Norway, et cetera, yes. That's pretty big. Yes. What distinguishes you from everybody else? Um, well, our track record certainly uh, uh, speaks for itself. Since 1990, when we were created, um, the fund has earned over a 10% return compounded every year, which uh, goes a long way to secure the pensions for our members. Um, I think if you, The Economist came out with an article uh, about a year ago talking about the, the Canadian model, and Teachers really was the forerunner of that. Uh, many of the other pension plans in Canada have, have, uh, have followed suit and set up the same governance structure that we have. And that's really been the key, is, is proper governance right from the top. Uh, in our case, um, the risk of the plan is shared equally between the employer and the employee. So employer the, being the Ontario being, government? Being the Ontario government and the teachers union. So it's a 50-50 deal. If there are surpluses, they both enjoy the surpluses. If they're deficits, they both have to uh, determine what to do about it. So it's not the traditional employee-employer, collective bargaining, banging heads together. It's a, this plan is here to provide security to our members, and how are we going to do this together? A number of follow-ups come out of there. First of all, how do you, what's the secret to getting double-digit returns annually? A uh, whole bunch of smart people who know what they're doing. Um, and it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, this plan, the investment side of this plan, has evolved over 20 years. I mean, 20 years ago, we weren't doing the same things we're doing today. Mm -hmm. uh, that's partly because some of the financial instruments and markets are much more sophisticated than they were 20 years ago. But also, we wouldn't have been prepared uh, to take on the risks 20 years ago that we're prepared to take on now because we have the experience. Having said that, you guys are probably not nutty bananas about getting into things like uh, subprime mortgages and all of that, are you? No, we were not anywhere near uh, that market, but you know, for many people, buying a hockey team in the National Hockey League is a pretty risky uh, event. A actually, Mr. Leach, if I can tell you, buying the Leafs is about the safest bet you can make if you're <laughs> going to buy a hockey team. Uh, it you certainly agree? has uh, proven, <laughs> it proved its worth for the teachers of Ontario. Uh, did you, would you, you make sixfold on that one? Yeah, approximately. Something yes. like that. Yeah. Okay. Having said that, it's not all uh, great news. You're five billion short right now, aren't you? That's correct. Uh, our preliminary valuation at the end of the year showed a small deficit. Now five billion dollars isn't a small number, but in the context of our 130 billion dollar plan, it's very, very manageable. Uh, there are a number of uh, headwinds that we still are fighting constantly. Uh, the first being the economic conditions, low returns. You know, when uh, Canadian real rate bonds issued by the Government of Canada are trading at 0.4 percent, uh, it makes it tough to try to earn uh, the returns. Um, and then secondly, the demographic tsunami that's uh, changing all pension plans uh, around the world and in, in causing us all to come to grips with you know, what changes, what evolution do we need in order to absorb this great change that's happening in the demographics. 
Can I add another layer to that? And you tell me if I'm off base here, but uh, clearly people are living longer. Yep. And therefore, you're having to pay out pensions for longer than you would have had to Correct. several generations ago. And even beyond that, most folks, I guess, when they have a career, want to work about 35 years in that career. And I gather the average that a teacher works is 26 years. So yes. you are potentially paying out pensions earlier than others have to as well. That's correct. Is our, that part of our, the complication? Uh, average retirement age is 59. Um, you know, and that compares to the private sector, which is more like 65 plus. Um, most public service uh, workers retire sort of 62, 63. So yes, retire early, um, working for about 26 years, and they'll retire and be on pension for about 31. Um, and then uh, when they die, their spouse will will pay for about another four years. The gift that keeps on giving. It is. Well, the teachers Shouldn't... keep on living. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do something about that? Well, no, but I mean, th listen, this is good news. Um, people are living longer. We have 2,800 people over the age of, of 90, and we've got 107 over the age of 100. Well, it's good news in one respect, but uh, I'm guessing your actuaries think it's not great news when somebody who becomes a teacher today certainly doesn't have the same expectation of getting as rich a pension return as people who joined the profession 25 or 30 years ago, fair to say? Well, the pension benefits and the contributions have changed in every decade. Uh, if you go back to 1917 when teachers first started getting pensions, they've changed every decade. So for example, in the 70s um, was when they first introduced uh, inflation protection. So the people in, retired in the 50s and 60s didn't get that. Um, uh, and, and now we've introduced conditional inflation protection and said, okay, it's got to be conditional on how well the fund is performing. So uh, the one thing I know for sure is it will continue to evolve as it responds to conditions around. I mean, any living organism has to change to its environment uh, or it's going to perish. And fortunately, this plan is strong. And fortunately, it's also taking the necessary steps now as opposed to waiting till you're in a crisis like we see south of the border in particular. Those necessary steps you're talking about have involved, if I recall the past year accurately, uh, your members pitching in more and the government getting a bit of a break on what it p put in. And I wonder how happy... No, the government and the, and the teachers have paid exactly the same amount every year. That hasn't changed at all. Well, how much savings did the government book this year because of the fact that in put in as much this year as last? Oh, they put in more this year than they put in last. They put in the same amount as the teachers. What not as much they as they expected to. Booked, um, I, don't, I don't think so. I'm, I'm not sure where that's coming from. I mean, the fact of the matter is, the, the fact that wages were frozen for three years helped. Okay. Um, but that isn't, that isn't how much money they put in. I mean, both contribute around a billion and a half dollars to the plan every single year. Okay, but again, getting back to my original example, if you're a teacher today, you're going to put in more of your earnings into the pension plan in order to get your payoff than people of several generations ago. That's correct. And I wonder, if, you know, how... But you're living that much longer you're living than that those much. people, too. Oh. And, and with, these, with today's interest rates, mm -hmm. um, it takes about... To, to, to produce a, a pension of, let's say, $40,000 a year, um, it takes today about a million dollars, hmm. okay? Um, back when interest rates were four or five percent, it cost about 600,000. So yes, you're putting in more, uh, you're living a lot longer, so we gotta save that much more money to make sure that you've got what you uh, believe. But I wonder if you hear it from the teachers on the front lines when they hear that they're gonna have to put in more, do they get ticked off at you for that? They, well, first of all, we don't make decisions about contribution rates and benefit levels. That's the sponsors. Our job is we have three, three prongs to what we do. Um, one is invest the money. Uh, secondly is to administer the pensions and pay them, et cetera. And the third is to advise the sponsors with regard to valuation, to say this is the health of your plan. The sponsors, the government and the teachers' unions together, make decisions about contribution rates, benefit levels, and they're the ones who decide if there's a surplus, what we're going to do about it, and if there's a deficit, what we're going to do about it. Okay. You uh, took the job, what, about 2007? 
I became CEO at the end of 2007. A great time. I was just going to say, you, <laughs> I can't think of worse time. My predecessor was a lot got smarter out, than me. Claude got out at the right That's time, right. didn't he? Yeah. So uh, seven months after or eight months after you got the job, the world economy goes into the you-know-what, yep. and um, the markets go for a crash, et cetera, et cetera. So how did you have to change your approach to investing, given the cataclysm that was happening around you? Well, the first thing was, um, you know, I was fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to have lived through the 87 debacle in the markets. Um, as I walked around, I, I remember vividly walking around after the Lehman uh, collapse and going out on the trading floor and looking at people and determined there were probably only three of us who had been in the business in 1987. The bulk of the, because it's a young person's game, the bulk of the people, you know, they were probably in public school uh, in 1987. And it came, it was, I mean, we were fairly quick to recognize that they needed our support. These people who were making investment decisions day in and day out um, saw, you know, they, they, yesterday they'd invested in something at 100 and all of a sudden it's trading at 75. And they're, they were feeling as though it was their fault. Hmm. They had somehow to blame. So the very first thing we had to do was, was to get everybody focused on, you know, now there's a new reality. Let's make a decision. Is that investment still good? Are we going to hold it? Or are we not going to hold it? So that was kind of job number one, bolstering everybody and saying, focus on the job, people. Um, the second thing was we had to look very quickly at our own liquidity. Uh, because where an institution such as a pension plan can get into trouble in a crisis like that is when you're up against um, a liquidity squeeze where you've got to start selling assets to meet obligations. Um, and so I sat down with the chief investment officer and we kind of just arbitrarily uh, tripled, doubled or tripled our liquidity uh, uh, guidelines, et cetera, so that we got ourselves liquid. And that, that sent was a, a huge, signal, I guess. That's right. But it was a huge advantage because what happened is some other institutions who hadn't done that all of a sudden had their backs to the wall and had to start selling things. And we were able to make a number of very interesting purchases in the last quarter of 2008 at very attractive prices. Like what? Because we had cash in our, well, I mean, boring things like Government of Canada bonds. Um, all of a sudden, there were some institutions that had to dump them. And they're, you know, we're sitting there. So we probably picked up five or six billion dollars. At fire sale prices? At fire sale prices, yeah. huh. Given that you were surrounded by, if I can put it this way, children in the rest of the <laughs> business, did the fact that, that you had been around for a while give you uh, an institutional memory that was advantageous at this time? Oh, for sure. And not just myself. Um, you know, we people like uh, Neil Petroff, our chief investment officer, Ron Mock, who runs our fixed income and and, um, and alternative investments. I mean, their hair is thinning, and they were there in, in those good old days. What's the best deal you ever made? What's the best deal I ever made? As head of teachers. Hmm. You know, the, I, that's a good one. Probably the one that worked out almost textbook-like was the purchase of Yellow Pages from BCE. Uh, in back in 2002, I think it was. Um, that probably worked out. You couldn't write a scenario that could have worked out much better than that. Why, why did it work so well? Well, we, 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 we bought it from a willing and somewhat compelled seller. Um, we, did, we did well on the purchase, we think. And immediately, uh, or shortly thereafter, uh, the income trust market was created in Canada, which gave us a market to uh, an exit that we never thought we'd ever see. And we didn't take advantage of that for a couple of years, but uh, it, it allowed us to uh, do very, very well. What's the status of it today? Well, we sold it, mm -hmm. uh, went public, uh, we sold out, and then it did get into trouble with uh, the fact that the digital world overcame the, um, the print world. That's what I was going to ask. Does it even exist anymore? Uh, yeah, they went through bankruptcy, and it's come out as something yellow else. something. Yeah. The worst yellow deal, media. yellow media. The worst deal you ever made? Oh, the worst deal. Um, you didn't think I was just going to ask you about the best wow, one? Wow, that's you? good. I, let me let me um, give you an anecdote that uh, that wasn't me, but would have been me, and that was when teachers uh, first started into the private investing side. They they was back in the early '90s, and they said, "Well, we're going to 
we're going to do this ourselves. And they, um, the very first transaction they did was a nursery by the name, by the, exists in other uh, incarnations now called White Rose. Uh, so it's a nursery uh, company. And I think they put $20 million in. Um, and we're pretty proud about this. It's a kind of neat transaction. And within months, they went bankrupt and they lost every penny. Hmm. Um, and the interesting thing about that that's always been curious to me is that they kept on in the business. Instead of saying, yeah, we tried this, didn't work, we're getting out of the, you know, we, dried a drill, uh, we, we drilled a dry hole on the first shot, we're getting out of the business, they didn't. And all the credit to them uh, to, to say, no, okay, what lessons did we learn from that? What could, how could we morph this program so it would work? And from that day until today, that group, the private equity group, has earned over 20% per annum every mm -hmm. single year. So a good idea to keep drilling in that case. Exactly. I do have to ask you about Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment because mm -hmm. that's just such an extraordinary property which you own 70% of and right. then made the decision to sell. Right. Because it's so atypical as a piece of something that you would own, it's just not like any other business, right? It's just so iconic. What goes into your thought process to dispose of something that historic, wealth-creating, uh, iconic, et cetera? Well, very good question, because we spent a lot of time on that. This investment had done very, very well for us. Um, it you know, was, was very stable. It had uh, you know, pretty predictable earnings, uh, et cetera. Uh, disappointed by its track record on the ice, but uh, not off certainly the ice. not off the ice. Um, and when we looked at it, we said, okay, the next phase of growth here is going to be media. That's really the next thrust. We, we, the sports teams have basically been maxed out. There are not many more seats you can put in. Uh, we built the, uh, uh, the surrounding properties, which have you know, a sort of auxiliary fan uh, uh, seating, et cetera. Uh, we'd expanded into different sports. And there just to remind everybody, things where the Maple go. Leafs, the Raptors, Toronto, Toronto FC, FC, and the Marlies. The, the Marlies, and, yeah. and the building, I assume, too, the building right? Air Canada and Center. The number, yes, which is yeah. the second um, busiest concert venue in North America. So it's a gold mine. It so. was a gold mine. Yeah. It was a very good investment. Mm -hmm. um, however, the price, so, so we sat down and said, okay, this next phase has got to be really exploiting media. And will we go and start our own uh, TV channels that will take on TSN and Sports, Sportsnet? Um, and so that was really the decision. We looked at it and said, okay, we could do that. And we had mapped out a plan. It was going to take us six years or whatever. And you know, if it worked, it was going to be worth X. And when somebody comes along and says, well, you don't have to do that work. You don't have to take that risk. And we're going to pay you X plus now, it was an easy decision. And as my, you know, the, the funny part about it is my, my seven-year-old grandson said to me, and his teacher father put him up to this, Grandpa, you're nothing but a cold, hard-hearted fiduciary. <laughs> he used the word fiduciary? Yeah. As I said, he was put up to it. I'm impressed. That's good. <laughs> is there a difference, though, when you walk into the Air Canada Center to go to a Leaf game or a Raptor game no longer as the quote-unquote owner of the Toronto Maple Leafs? Yeah. I, I mean, I'd be... I wouldn't be telling the truth if I didn't say yes. Um, one thing, as my wife pointed out to me, if they're not playing well, we can leave. Uh, <laughs> but, but other than that, um, I'm a fan and always was a fan when, I, when we were the owner and, and now, and I wish them all the best. I was there last night for the first game, and I'll be there for the second game at home. Uh, let's just ask in our last uh, half minute or so here, have they chosen your successor yet? Uh, that should be announced uh, sometime between now and mid-year. And do you have a say in it? Uh, I have participated. It, 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 it's the board's decision. The board has had a succession committee running since 2011 when I told them I wanted to retire at the end of this year. Um, and uh, they have done an extensive search externally and internally. Uh, I think they're on the verge of making a decision. I have been included in all of their deliberation. What kinds of pension reforms do you think ought to be at the top of the list of whoever succeeds you? 
Well, the, the very first thing, and it's a process that's underway now, is to um, examine the, the cost of this imbalance between the number of years worked at 26 and the number of years in retirement. That math is not sustainable. It's only going to get worse. Um, and so it really, because it's a, it's a big cost. The people who are teaching longer are subsidizing those who are getting out early. And there's an unfairness there that doesn't quite work. Uh, and there's a cost which should not be borne by the plan. So someone's going to have to go tell tens of thousands of teachers, you want to retire when you're 58 or 57? You can't start collecting for another five or six years, something or like that? Or the cost, the cost has to have to be changed. Um, um, I mean, it isn't that there has to be a mandate that every teacher has to work till they're, in, you know, 62 or something like that. It can be done on just saying, okay, if you're leaving early, we're, you're not going to be subsidized the way you are today. That'll be a fun conversation. Well, the process is underway. We've engaged uh, Dr. Harry Arthurs, and we have a task force going, which includes government representatives, the union representatives, and, uh, and, and the plan. And as I said, these groups, I mean, even last year when they were at war with each other under the collective bargaining uh, process, um, throughout that we were having meetings about the plan, and there's they're partners, they're sponsors. No, you got a result. Amidst all working, of that education yeah, warring, you did right. get that result. They, they, take, they take their job as sponsors very responsibly, and I, I take my hat off to them. That's Jim Leach, soon to be the former head of the Teachers' Pension Plan, and we wish you well with whatever comes next. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.